Good evening. Uh, nice to see you here. I hope this is, uh, yeah, it looks like it's coming up on the correct thing. So um, welcome. Uh, none of my panelists have joined me as yet, but uh, that doesn't mean too much yet. Um, I'm just trying to get a picture of um, Medusa up on the screen. So my camera is blocking my view. So there she is. Okay. All right. So we were going to talk about Medusa to begin with tonight. And um, let's see. I guess I'm going to do one thing before Medusa. And that is, I'm going to um, remind everyone that on October the 27th at 2 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time, I'll be giving a live program from Unity by the Bay in Annapolis, Maryland, I'm hoping that I'm going to be able to broadcast it live. If it doesn't come on at that time, it is only because um, it is only because the Wi-Fi isn't good enough at the venue. And in that case, I'll be republishing the playlist very quickly. Um, so I wanted to show you the um, brochure for that. And this is the brochure. And uh, as you see on this brochure, there's a link to take a look at one of my numinous experiences. And this other image is, an ex is uh, another one of my numer numinous experiences, which took place in the Naval Academy Chapel, as many of you know. And um, this link here, uh, which is the homepage of the YouTube channel, is where you'll be able to find the broadcast if you're outside of the Annapolis area. Of course, I would love to have you join us live uh, at Unity by the Bay in Annapolis if you're available. So uh, I'm just sort of scrolling through this so everybody can see uh, all these contact points and the main issues that I'm going to be addressing. And um, so I seem to have somebody else here, but I don't know who. Hold on a moment. There's Miles, allowed to talk. Okay. There's Miles, you've been unmuted. And uh, can, can you hear me all right? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, so I was listening uh, to Dr. Grande's um, videos just before coming on here. It's uh, sort of interesting uh, what he had to say. Um, you know, I wouldn't want to get into that kind of a discussion about what medications are right or not right for uh, Jordan Peterson. Uh, but, you know, he, he seems to have an opinion and, and um, so if you want to uh, put that link on, and then I watched another uh, video just a short time ago. Um, and I think I may have deleted it now, but also from Dr. Grande, where he was giving his op opinion on Jordan Peterson. And, um, you know, it, it was okay. I mean, it, what, what I didn't cotton to terribly much was that while he criticized Dr. Peterson's knowledge of uh, Jung, he made some rather uh, snide comments about Dr. Jung, which basically showed that he doesn't know anything about Dr. Jung and what his work was really about. And so I left him a comment to that effect um, 
for what it's worth and offered to chat with them about it <laughs> because uh, you know he, he what what he said in in the the second video was that um, Jung was not an assi a scientist that he wrote a lot of opinion well all all scientists write a lot of opinions and Dr. Jung de very definitely was a scientist he uh, examined more than 80,000 dreams in his career. Um, but <clears throat> um, he, what can I say? Um, he didn't solve for X. It wasn't, he didn't see his task as uh, following the traditional scientific method about leaving everything um, leaving everything uh, constant, you know, holding all the variables constant and then solving for X, which allows you to get statistics. But in the psyche, it's a little hard to do that because people, uh, the psyche of human beings wiggles quite a bit more than X does. But anyway, that's my opinion and comment. Hi, Art. Nice to see you. Uh, and good evening, uh, Rocket King. Um, and uh, so anyway, um, so those were my comments on his, his work there. I, you know, I don't know that, um, you know, you know, I, I wouldn't presume to comment on Jordan Peterson's medications and what he's doing. I think that that's not my role and, and quite inappropriate. So good evening, Jerome. Welcome. Well, thank you, Skip. Um, Zoom decided to reprogram itself when I signed on, so I had to wait. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been, as you know, I've been having lots of fun in the last uh, few couple of weeks with Zoom and um, editing videos and iPad Pro <laughs> and iMovie and Filmora. Uh, but I think I've sort of got a routine now that might work. Which well, uh, yeah, it's a learning experience. That's for one thing. Yeah. Uh, well, well, I see Miles is on here. Uh, yes, Miles is here, but he's I want, incognito. Oh, I wanted to mention him. It's Happy Thanksgiving in Canada today. Oh, Happy Thanksgiving in Canada. I think that was Thank yesterday, you. though. And uh, when, when was it? Uh, yesterday. Or I today? Was, I thought it was today. Is it it's today, today, Miles? Yes, oh. it's today. So you're, you're not showing yourself because you're not showing the fact that you're sleeping from the big meal you're eating. Actually, I don't, I don't understand. I, you know, sometimes I have a camera function. Um, and Hello, Jennifer. Nice to see you. I don't know if you have to turn my camera on at your side. I don't have the icon for it. Um, let's see. Do I have anything that could do that for you. Unmute audio, disable talking, remove, hide non-video participants. You seem to be a non-video participant for some reason. I don't know why. Um, so you might want to look at your settings. Um, well, I think when you first sign on, it asks you if you want to join with the video. You might try that. Yeah, you might okay, want to just log I'll off and log back on, Miles. Okay. Okay. So um, tonight I thought I would uh, sort of have an open mic with careful uh, observation of uh, comments in the chat. And uh, hi, Nancy, nice to see you um, about what's going on in current events and see if we can come up with uh, some some comments about those current events in terms of uh, Jungian psychology. So I happen to have been watching a video that I, I like very much uh, of Jordan Peterson's, um, I think it's called uh, 
wisdom of the sacred or something like that. And in there, he was talking about uh, Medusa. And he actually had in there a picture of Medusa uh, in, what, in part of the video. And, um, and of course, Medusa was in mythology, the Gorgon who, if you looked at her, uh, she would um, turn you to stone. And Dr. Peterson described that as how very often um, if you're a, a prey animal, if you're being preyed upon, if you're attacked by something bigger and meaner, uh, you'll often just freeze okay, be turned to stone in order to hide basically so that the atom, the prey, the predator won't get you. And I actually had this experience when I was about 10 years old. I think I was in, let's see, I must have been in the third grade, I suppose, but I was living in the subdivision and somebody had a, um, uh, German Shepherd and this German Shepherd and I was quite small at that time as you can imagine I was I probably weighed 50 or 60 pounds and uh, the prey animal or the German Shepherd came running across the field after me and I ran away from it at first but then instinctually I just stopped and it wasn't a matter of thinking about it. it. Instinctually, I just stopped and turned around and looked at this dog and he stopped. And I think even though I was 60 pounds, I was maybe a little bit bigger than he was. <laughs> and he, he, I think I kind of surprised him. And so he stopped and went away, that was it. And so, there is, some, there is certainly something to that. And, and very often, uh, I don't know about what, Jerome, what would you do if you got cornered by a, uh, let's see, I have a chat here from, from Miles. What would you do if a black bear came along and surprised you? I'm gonna uh, run. With no mic and well, let, let's see. Now let's see maybe I is. maybe I can get you back in, Miles. Let's see. Promote to panelist. Hey, that might work. Yeah, I'll see if that does it. There you are. You're promoted to panelist, Miles. So now you should. Oh, ah, there you are. Yay! There you are. Okay. <laughs> All right. How do you get three on the screen now? <laughs> yeah, that's that's the oh, trick. There, there you go. You got it. Yeah, you're there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And no, if I uh, you asked me if I saw a bear, since I do have a bear that runs around the house here all the time. Right. So I always make noise when I go outside first. But I think if I ran into him by uh, accident, I think I would run like you know what. <laughs> uh huh. And 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 my guess is you wouldn't outrun him. So that that wouldn't be good necessarily. I know it's probably a bad move. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what, I, what, I, what I thought I'd do is carry a jar of honey, one of these squeezed bottles and just throw it at him. And... Well, that, that might work. <laughs> 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 or not throw it at him, but throw it to him and he, say, well, yeah, to him. Yeah, and say, <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Jerome has this black bear that, uh, is when it stands on its hind legs, uh, its nose can reach the eaves of his house. So it's that big. Yeah. And um, he drinks the hummingbird sugar water and he's very intelligent. He <laughs> tilts, tilts it back and leaks it. I mean, he's just, he's something to watch. Yeah. Uh, well, as, as long as you have a wall between you and him, that, that's fine. <laughs> that's my safety net right there. Yeah. So. But anyway, freezing is, uh, you mentioned freezing. It's also right. something people do psychologically when they uh, maybe run into a, 
someone that they don't know how to deal with. They freeze. Right. And so that that that's a good segue into talking about our current events um, because uh, it's obvious that we have the GOP um, completely turned to stone in the United States, <laughs> unable to react to our president and his shenanigans. And uh, they've started to become quite dangerous, I think, because, um, you know, as a retired Marine and, and being around the military my whole life, I'm just shocked by what he did in pulling out of northern Syria and throwing our allies, the Kurds, to the to the wolves. That's that's really I mean, the only thing that that is to me is selling out to Vladimir Putin and to a lesser extent to Erdogan. And I'm very troubled by that, very troubled. And, um, you know, we can't, <laughs> how do we expect or how, do, how does he expect um, and how do our leaders expect that we will have any allies in the future or anybody will believe us in the future when we pull something like that? Um, you know, well, I, I think he single-handedly has... Uh, there are different stages. You, he's withdrawing into uh, the United States. He's, you know, like this, and he's not reaching out and to the global effort. And we have a global economy. Yeah, that and train that train left a long time ago. As you, know, oh yeah, you've been in business and sure for someone to come in and think that they can change our global economy. I mean, that, yeah, that, that ain't happening. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, you get drugs from all different countries, you get metals. I mean, it's a whole network of things. It's bigger right. than a red box. And, right. you, and you can't just withdraw and build a wall around yourself. Uh, that's not going to work. You know? Right. And, um, you know, 15 years ago, I used to resist the idea that the United States was, is the policeman of the world. Um, the, and I didn't think we should have that role. Uh, but today I do think so, because there's no one else that uh, will do it conscientiously, uh, at least. Uh, and I'm hoping that we can make some changes here relatively quickly that will uh, allow us to, again, display the fact that Americans can be conscientious. I mean, when I used to travel in the Middle East, and I've done quite a lot of it, as you know, um, I was always quite proud to be an American and always thought I was bringing something good to the peoples that I was uh, dealing with and was always trying to bring something good to those people. And uh, to, to see this behavior now, I mean, you know, it just, it, it's just beyond belief. And um, so anyway, um, I'm very troubled by it personally. And um, I'm hopeful that things will move ahead quickly um, to um, get it resolved uh, in our government because we can't go on this way. Um, and you know, if anybody has any, you know, thinks, oh, well, this is over in Syria and this is not our problem. There, there are 11,000 uh, ISIS prisoners in northern Syria that if they're turned loose, uh, some of them are going to find their way into the United States with fake passports and all kinds of stuff. And they can wreak, wreak all kinds of havoc on us. We saw already what 20 Saudis could do on a single morning. Um, 18 years ago. And so we have to be conscientious that, you know, there are some places in the world that we have to keep bottled up until, until people um, evolve. Okay. And it's literally an evolution 
that has to take place and it, and it needs to be done uh, firmly, not, but not cruelly. And, um, and so, I don't know. Uh, I'm certainly happy to take comments from uh, our YouTube chat group. Um, and we'll, we can talk about some of your comments as well. I'm, I'm just um, trying to open the issue up. Um, so I'm going to make a prophecy. And my prophecy is that there is not going to be a trial in the Senate. And uh, I, I actually doubt very much that there will be an impeachment. Uh, what, what I think will happen here is that in fairly short order, because I understand that, um, I understand that the time to apply for a, um, a primary in most states is over in like November. Uh, and it's anyway coming up soon most places because Iowa's caucuses are February 4th. So there's not that much time left before uh, we're right deeply into the election season. And so if that's true, if the, if, you know, one of the president's main threats that has, has turned the GOP into stone so they can't do anything has been that they, he would primary uh, sitting congressmen and senators and put some of his own henchmen in, in the primary. And so, if that time passes and he can't do that anymore, then I think Katie bar the door, then things can happen fairly quickly. And those people are gonna to wanna to look to where the American people are going to be a year from now. Uh, because so far we haven't had any big crisis that's touched people at home terribly. Um, Although I think if I was an Iowa farmer and I had been promised um, help with selling wheat to China or whatever it is, or corn uh, to China, and then I lose that market, and they, then they promise to give you subsidies to make up for that, and then they don't pay the subsidies, which is a typical of what this man seems to do. He doesn't seem to want to pay his bills. Um, I think I might be pretty angry if I were sitting in Iowa. I can't speak for anyone else, but, um, and so my prophecy is that uh, at some point, the pressure is going to get much hotter and that uh, the president is simply going to resign for health reasons or something else. And he's gonna come out with some sweet deal. I'm not saying he's gonna go to jail, he won't. So somehow they'll work out a deal so that, that he can walk away, no harm, no foul. But he's gonna to have to do that soon because the, the worse it gets, uh, the harder it is for him. <laughs> it's going to be for him to cut a deal and the angrier people will be with him. I'm surprised they put up with him this long, but I do agree with Jordan Peterson that he, um, he's like Medusa. He's stunned these GOP legislators and they just won't do anything. Um, they're afraid of doing anything. And, uh, and well, well the, the consequences of uh, them doing something is they're out of a job or he, he rants and raves and he diminishes them with some statements, which, you know, I'm sorry, but when I grew up, we've respected each other and people and we don't, uh, resort to such name calling and such childish things like that. I mean, yeah, uh, the, that, that's just not the way that 
I was raised or I believe in. Uh, you well, know, I don't think uh, any Americans, people that have been raised in the latter half of the 20th century would believe as you do, I think. Yeah, and you know, in, vis you know in business, you're a businessman. I was in uh, a corporation for 30 years and everybody was treated with respect and uh, uh, equality. And I mean, it was just a good environment. And you come out and look at what's happening here. It's just, uh, uh, you know, it really makes me feel kind of like, what's going on here, you know? Yeah. And... Um... So one of the things that Jordan Peterson said in this video, and let me, I can get the name of the video. I happen to have it here. So, cause I had, I had saved it in my iPhone library so I can, um, I can give you the name of the Peterson video. It is called reality and the sacred. Okay. And so, um, it, it would be on Jordan Peterson's YouTube cha channel, and I'll put it on the uh, YouTube uh, chat. It, um, it's called Reality and the uh, Sacred. Is this a recent? Uh, no, it's 2009. Oh, okay. That's why and, I didn't see. Yeah. And uh, it's quite a good video. It's actually a class that he was teaching. Oh, okay. So that's and, this, yeah. And... Um, and I highly recommend taking a look at that one. Um, and, <clears throat> and so anyway, um, one of the things he's talking about in, uh, let's see, then there's another video, I guess I should give the name of, um, let's see if I can find that one. Um, which is called, I think it's called, uh, Who is God? Um, who is God, Jordan? Question mark. <laughs> and it's, uh, all right, I'll put that name on here too. It's, that's not by Jordan, is it? <laughs> well, it's it's with him and um, uh, who's the uh, the radio commentator that is so famous? Um, uh, anyway, uh, it's on a channel called One Question. Oh, okay. Okay, it's a channel called One Question, and. Um, in one of those two places, he was talking about the fact that throughout history and in the Bible also, um, civilizations build up, order builds up out of chaos. And then, um, and then there's corruption at the top. And, um, and then um, there's a collapse and chaos ensues, and then order builds up again. And that's a, that's a, a cycle that goes on in all, um, well, in the Bible, he says it is repeated six times in the Bible. I haven't looked at that, so I can't say that it's happened six times, but that's what Jordan says. And he seems to be pretty clear on it. Now there's another one. There's another image that he used in there that I want to, I can share with you. Um, I hope. Okay. This is a very, very interesting. Um, I did find it. So I'll share it. Uh, this is a very interesting image from medieval times when uh, people understood things a bit differently than we understand them now. And so one of the things that this shows, this is actually supposedly an image of Mary, mother of God. Uh, however, when you open it up, 
it has God the Father inside Mary, and then God the Father is holding up Jesus Christ. And so Jordan Peterson's point is that this image demonstrates uh, the Virgin Mary as uh, Mother Nature, and that God is within Mother Nature, as we've been saying, God is supernatural, not supernatural. So by supernatural, we mean in the, in the natural covenant. And so God is within nature, and then Christ is the Son of God in that, in that context, but it shows the Virgin Mary as Mother Nature. Do you have any comments on that? I'll pull that off. Okay, I'm just trying to still look at it, but uh, there was an angel on the left. Is that okay, I, I'll put it back up, man. I'm oh. sorry. Let me put it back up so you can see it as long as you want, and you can comment on it as you wish. All right, on, so the, left, uh, on the left side, uh, uh, there's a figure looking. It's, it looks like a figure on the left side. Hmm. Right. I, I don't know who that is. There's, there's a, it looks like a male figure that if you close the box, the, this box is obviously opened. Oh, yeah. Right. And then his face would be underneath her. Right. So face, his, wh whoever's, whoever that is, and I don't know who that is because I tried to find this image and I could not figure out where Jordan found it. Yeah. Um, and within the wings, there's all sorts of characters. Uh, right. All, all uh, kinds of saints and sinners and all sorts yeah. of people. So right. we're, we're overwhelmed with all these figures inside ourselves. <laughs> Correct. And so, I, I don't know, maybe Nancy has seen an image like this and might uh, yeah. know where we could find uh, a commentary on it. It's obviously a, a Catholic image. And Jordan Peterson, in one of those two videos, I don't know which one, uh, said that this these were medieval. This is a medieval image, and there were a couple of others that he showed. Uh, but I thought this one was particularly interesting because it does um, show God the Father as supernatural, which is a point that I've been making that you know supernatural things are Santa Claus and the Tooth Fairy, but supernatural things are things that actually exist in within nature and so since mother nature is the origin of all things there he is and so that was certainly a different perspective on god the father uh 500 years ago somehow we got off off the topic though do you want me to leave that up continue to leave that up or you want to no, that's fine. I've, okay. uh, yeah, I was trying to relate it to some of the Jungian concepts that we've been looking at in right. terms of, uh, you know, having the uh, uh, God and Imago. I can't say that word. Imago, yeah. Right, yeah. Um, so, yeah, the image of God within us, right? Yeah, God, and, the God and, image. Yeah, and he was saying that was kind of the, what he thought the true self was, the authentic self. Right. Was a manifestation of that particular imago. Right. That's the same. You got to think of this not in terms of drawing a picture like we saw, but it's it's within. Yeah, it's, it's, an, ar a, it's an archetype within that is right, at, at the deepest level of the psyche. Yeah, so you can't really you can't really draw a big picture of it because it's it's kind of not uh, right visible in other words. Right. So Nancy has answered us here. These are used as holy symbols in a religious building or even in the home. Having one in one's home can make images within us stir. Uh, yes, I agree with that, Nancy. But I I don't remember ever seeing one that was quite like this that showed mother nature including um 
God the Father within her. Um, I mean, whether whether it's whether it's the Virgin Mary or Mother Nature begs the question, right? Because it appears to be um, apparently when the box is closed, as Jordan explained it, when the box is closed, it appears to be an image of either a nun or the Virgin Mary. I guess it's the Virgin Mary because she's holding an apple in one hand and I don't know what, I don't know what's happening on the outside of the box, but um, she's sort of dressed like a nun, I suppose. Um, and uh, let me put it back for a minute longer here. So, cause I'm looking at it and describing it and then you, <laughs> you guys can't see, see it. I apologize for that. Okay. But anyway, um, I don't ever remember seeing an image like this or having noticed it. Nancy says in Orthodox community, she is called mother of God. Aha. Uh -huh, interesting. Okay. And, and I have heard that term uh, and it just, I never grokked it in that way, Nancy, honestly. And, and I, I now get it. You're right. You're right. So she is mother of God and mother of God in God, the father and God, God the son, I guess. And uh, does that relate back to Sophia? Uh, yes, I, I would think. Well, but Sophia was more an equal. Okay. She was, Sophia is wisdom, and she was there in the Pleroma yeah. with, you know. Uh, well, so, we're, we're, we're talking about manifestations from the Pleroma, which is undescribable, right. which is really the self, which is everything and nothing. Right, right. Uh, so that's the whole sphere of the, what Jung called the Pleroma. Right. And so what we see are manifestations and different things from that Paloma that we paint in the outside. Right. So. Okay, so I, I had never thought of it. And I, whenever I heard Mother of God in the past, up until this moment when Nancy's mentioned it on the chat, I always thought it meant Jesus Christ. But in the context of this, um, icon or this carving, uh, it has a completely different meaning. It means both of them. It means God and God the Father and God the Son. And, uh, and so it also implies that the Virgin Mary is a manifestation of Mother Nature, right? Interesting. We learn something every day. We sure do. <laughs> yeah. Now, now. I don't know if Miles wants to say something. Well, Miles has been hanging around Orthodox churches with, <laughs> with icons. So, maybe, have you seen an image like that before, Miles? Not that I can recall, but I am thinking there are passages in the Bible where it says that God indwells within us and that there's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. In fact, Paul Vanderclay is talking to a, a gentleman who's got a degree in physics and is an ordained, ordained uh, Anglican uh, minister. So this gentleman is very intelligent. And mm -hmm. they're talking about Owen Barfield. At one, at one point, they, they reference another gentleman who says that you know, when you turn on lights and you fill up a room with light, you're actually looking, the photons are timeless because they're moving at the speed of light. And so they're not bounded by time. So I'm not totally, you know, going to try to explain that, but um, it, it seems that we are, uh, you know, this this saying that God is above or below us, as opposed to really emphasizing God's within us, it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Yet, you know, the pastors and priests will not consider or emphasize the supranatural presence of God in people. 
which I think and, is a failing. Well, and they keep they keep implying at, at least that there's a Gebet, Gepetto type figure up in the sky or somewhere who's going to direct your life. And I do agree that he directs our lives <laughs> or she with a capital S and a capital H, she. Um, directs the interesting our... thing I'll add is this Anglican, uh, ordained Anglican gentleman, he, he, dis, he did talk about how he recognizes that you don't have to be Christian to have God in you. You know, and mm -hmm. that was a powerful part of that presentation. So, um, you know, this ethnocentric or religious centric perspective on God is only in Christians, especially talking about this on, on, on Thanksgiving here in Canada, at the same time, it's being recognized as Indigenous Peoples Day rather than Christopher Columbus Day down there. Uh, is important because um, you know we cannot be so so uh, centric in in thinking about how Jesus might appear at different times and places and right. and uh, or God. So there's some thoughts. Yeah, that's good. Um, I'm I'm just looking for uh, uh, something that is I think in my, let's see, it must be in the Dropbox, I guess, in the general Dropbox. I'm hoping that if I can find it quickly, which is a, um, a print, um, transcript I did of Edward Edinger's uh, talk about um, Encounter with the Greater Personality. Let me, let me see, I'm in the Edinger section, but, uh, Because he uh, he too he talks about it and uh, talks about the demonstration. Uh, wait a minute, is that it? Maybe. Right. Okay. I can put it on the screen here so that all of you can read along with me. Um, this is my edited version, or not edited, but it's my transcript of it. And um, he's talking about the, the ego self axis with the self being the God image and the God within. And, um, and so um, I'm just gonna make my point, Rocket King, and I'll come back to yours. Um, so anyway, he says, uh, this is the one basic feature of Jungian psychology, the ego and how it relates to the reality of the self. Jungian psychology is the only psychological standpoint which operates out of an awareness that there are two centers in the psyche. Some other psychologies and analytical approaches have an awareness that there are two entities in the psyche, but no other psychological standpoint operates out of the awareness that there are two centers. This is unique to Jungian psychology. Since there are two centers, if that comes into conscious realization, then those two centers must collide. They must have an encounter with one another. That's what happens when the ego, which is the little center, has an encounter with the self, which is the big center. All analysis is no more than a prelude to this experience, the encounter with the self. And this experience is the religious experience, which I'll be describing in my talk on the 27th. So here's how Jung put it in his 1925 seminar. Quote, analysis should release an experience that rips us or falls upon us as from above, an experience that has substance and body, such as those experiences which happened to the ancients. If I were going to symbolize it, I would choose the Annunciation. 
And of course, the Annunciation is when the Virgin Mary is informed that she's going to deliver God's baby. Uh, and uh, he says, now it might very well happen that although this crucial experience, although it is prepared for by analysis, does not take place during the period of analysis at all, it may take place many years after termination of the analysis. In such a case, one is very grateful for his conscious knowledge of Jungian psychology. He has a roadmap, so to speak, which helps him get his bearings when his experience falls on him from above. He can say with Job, previously I heard of thee by the hearing of my ears, but now my eyes see thee. Um, that's what happens when the experience falls on one. One can also, uh, it can also occur without benefit of any analysis at all. It can happen without any particular preoccupation with the unconscious. For these reasons, I consider it vitally important to talk about the self in public because one can never know whether he is speaking to an individual who has had or is going to have uh, the experience I'm talking about. And such an individual may recall what has been spoken about and find it immensely helpful in his time of need. I know that for a fact that such things do happen. And what I would, um, what I would just further emphasize is that I consider these experiences basically um, what the ancients called a religious experience, a vision or a very powerful dream. And it, it's actually going to be the topic of my talk on the 27th is related to that. Uh -uh. Let's just say, oh, go ahead. Oh. Go ahead, Drew. Oh, okay. Contest here between the mouse. <laughs> so what's important here is this is kind of a segue back to where we talked about the freeze. Uh, if you start to have an experience like this and you freeze, uh, you know, and that can help that can prevent it and that can also you're not prepared for it uh whereas what eddinger was just saying is you it's helpful to learn about the jungian psychology to know that this is the way these things work and exist and you can be prepared for it and uh be able to experience that okay miles sorry. yeah i was um that, that's that's very true. And I would also just like to add that I've had a very profound religious experience and I've been sensing more numinosity and synchronicities ever since, you know, becoming more aware of the, the fact that these things are happening and having young through uh, skip, you know, give me this perspective, this insight, and opening my eyes, I'm I'm awakening, and you know I'm now thinking the very fact of each of our being is is a miracle in itself. So for anybody who hasn't maybe experienced some sort of contact with God just stop and think about the fact that we're all these miracles ourselves. We're these uh, numinous anomalies ourselves. Sure. When, you think, when you think about the vastness and the, and the immense void that is the universe, insofar as what we have been able to see of it, you know, with the Hubble Space Telescope, we have yet to see another Earth out there. So the planet and let's give the planet the name Mother Earth. Let's give the planet the name Nature with a capital N. The, the planet is a, a miracle. And we're, we've been generated out of it um, through, as you pointed out, Skip, often through a miracle of countless billions of, of successful 
um, reproductive events for sure. Sure. over evolutionary time. You know, yeah. we are everybody listening to this that should appreciate they're a miracle themselves. Yeah, and and furthermore, we're, this is the eternal moment. I I love that. Thing. In fact, I've been working on that with my calligraphy drum. So that I'm I'm going to do a single sheet that has the eternal moment on it. But the point is, you're not going to paint it on your arm or something. <laughs> uh, well, it's a little long for that. I might be able to get it on. My back. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, but but right. the point is that all the millions of ancestors that has led up to each one of us, including all the people on YouTube, um, all those millions of ancestors lived and died so that you can be here right now. This is the eternal moment. And uh, it's not about the future and it's not about the past. All of your ancestors have lived and died so that you can spend this time with us right this minute. And uh, that's when you think of it that way, you, you have to say, whoa, okay. So uh, we have 15 people that are following us on, the, on uh, the YouTube channel and we have three of us here. So that's 18 of us who um, are all of our ancestors built up to this moment. And of course, uh, last week, uh, I was very honored to see that within 48 hours, I think there were about 300 people who, who watched the video of last week's session. Um, now, Rekka King had a comment here that I didn't get to. He said, there's much debate over what the Christ moniker, son of man, means. I think the notion of the divine numinous self growing in the womb of the mortal psyche is one of the best arguments I've heard. I think uh, Dr. Jung would agree with you. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, what I've become aware of is that all of the great religions are naturally evolved methods for psychotherapy that have come up over thousands of years on their own. And uh, so I'm not going to say that any one of them is perfect, nor am I going to say that any interpretation of Son of Man or uh, the Anthropos um, is the right one. I mean, obviously, we've had, uh, we've had philosophers like John Verbeke who have been coming up with <laughs> answers uh, to that uh, since time immemorial. Um, and, you know, when, when a philosopher who is a logic, a logician, a logos guy, when logos guys slice and dice, other people can diverge. They can they not agree. Um, and I wonder, you know, the, the people that are very materialistic and scientific um, and want to somehow be able to slice and dice everything right. and uh, have it all intellectually explained, right. can, can they not see that their being is, and this, the now is a miracle, you know? So... Can secularists still appreciate the miraculous if they just reflect on how? Well, how they have to acknowledge it, but I mean, here here's the problem. Uh, let me show you that this picture from Sebastian Brandt, 1502, and what he did was he took, um, I think, what am I looking at? I'm looking at uh, the third picture of John that he created in 1502 and um, this is the picture he came up with and so he was trying to slice and dice all the ways that uh, John uh, the apostle John was described in the bible and that's what he came up with uh, and uh, so he was an alchemist but he was describing all the things that the apostle John had talked about 
during his lifetime. And I think I can get you also Luke. You might as well look at the Apostle Luke, <laughs> which is even a better one. Uh, okay, there, there's Luke. Okay, um, second picture of Luke by Sebastian Brandt, um, 1502. And so again, Sebastian Brandt in 1502, so 517 years ago was, uh, was a logic kind of guy and he was trying to slice and dice all the descriptions of the apostle Luke out of the Bible and represent them in one picture. And this is what he came up with. And you have to go, go wow. <laughs> so somehow it's, it's more complicated than that and less complicated than that both, but it's a pretty amazing image. Yeah, um, I was trying to figure out the images in there. So it's almost like a puzzle you can look at and try to oh, find yeah, things. That's, you know? exactly, that's <laughs> exactly what it is. Now, Nancy says, what a powerful experience grips us, giving it form through creative action can integrate it. I agree with that, absolutely. For example, painting the experience can balance the without and the within. And uh, I agree with that entirely. And as this group knows, um, Nancy and I have been talking about her experiences and also her own paintings and the paintings of many others uh, that she has brought to our attention. Uh, partially with the help of Jerome to uh, in her interviews. So uh, I would urge you to uh, watch this mini series that I've been posting uh, of my uh, interviews with Nancy. Uh, they're very powerful. I found uh, uh, part two and part three extremely powerful. And uh, I'll be posting part four in a week or so i have a lot of editing to do between now and then and and nancy and i still have one more session at least to do so it's going to be a very very powerful um series well, once you if you go through the it, whole thing yeah i've uh, been through them and that's very powerful and i appreciate that nancy has volunteered to do that and tell Absolutely. her story yeah uh Secondarily, you know what she's saying is when you experience something, you it's it's you want to bring that forward and integrate it, and that's what Young was talking about with his active imagination. Uh, all these procedures are don't keep it back in there and it just goes away, and you have another one, you know, and keep repeating that. That you don't do anything, mm -hmm. you know. So you, you don't, you need to bring that forward. It, it doesn't have to be painting. It can be, uh, you know, music, uh, poetry, uh, writing, uh, can be anything that uh, you're, you, you might be passionate about. Uh, right. And it doesn't have to be perfect. I'm right. a terrible artist. So, <laughs> well, I mean, one of the, one of the things that we need to keep in mind is that our psyche learn to communicate with our conscious mind millions of years before the invention of language, okay? So it was all done through images. And um, one of our listeners here, the Rocket King says, says to Nancy, right, I just started drawing mandalas last week and they're telling me quite a lot. And the reason is that the mandala is something that has been deep, deep in the living psyche for hundreds of millions of years. And he here's my proof of it. Okay, so uh, this is for those of you that haven't seen this. It's something that you need to know about. So this is uh, a diver and he's in the Sea of Japan and these mandalas that were found on the seafloor in the Sea of Japan in the 1990s were perfect mandalas. And nobody could figure out how they got there because even a human would have difficulty making 
uh, such a perfect mandala. And they kept looking for the culprit <coughs> that was doing these mandalas. And after uh, a lot of investigation, they discovered that it's this guy. Uh, and that is the puffer fish, uh, and also called the fugu fish, and in Japanese. And that's the fish that you don't want to eat at a Japanese restaurant unless you have a very competent chef because uh, he has a bladder in him that's uh, deadly to humans. Um, but what he does is in one five day period, he creates this mandala. And so here they caught a picture of him uh, doing it and another mandala that he or another one had created. And so that is, a, it's actually, uh, it, it actually amounts to a target because it, it's, the male fugu fish telling the female fugu fish, um, lay your eggs here. And oh, by the way, I'm a good bet for my genes to go on because I can really make wonderful mandalas. And so the female fugu fish comes along and sees this mandala and decides that he's the guy. And, and so she leaves her eggs there. And, uh, so the fugu fish and our ancestors separated at least 200 million years ago, according to Gray Yates. And I think that that's one of the, one of the most profound images that I've seen in terms of, you know, what its implications are for evolution and the evolution of the psyche and the evolution of, of um, the God image. Um, whatever. Any comments, gentlemen? Well, I thought that was great. Uh, it uh, looked like a little landing pad for you or something. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, you know, uh, spiders, uh, you know, they're webs, even though they're, they're sure. those are symmetric. You think of a nature of all these things that are birds' nests. Uh, sure. You think you can do all sorts of associations on this mandala uh, thing, so. Right, and so our psyche is, is um, communicating something to us on um, when it sends us an image like that. I'll share one more uh, mandala image because in Dr. Young's lifetime, he, the earliest human mandala that he could find was in Zimbabwe. Uh, and it was about 35,000 years old. This one was found in Kimberley, Australia, and it's 50,000 years old. And uh, so it's quite an impressive, uh, impressive mandala. So mandalas, I don't know, at 50,000 years ago, did human beings have a written language? I'm doubtful. Um, I don't know. Maybe somebody knows. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, 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 Miles mentioned Owen Varfield. Uh, Owen Varfield is all about the getting uh, the communication between uh, the ego and the self established, and it's a different language. Right. And that language is something that needs to be brought forward into our language system and a lot of poets have done that and what Owen Barfield was about was extracting that from what was said originally and bringing it to life and that's what we need Paul Vanderclay to do and recognize mm -hmm. uh, is it's still there but you can make these stories alive right uh, by uh, bringing this forward in the language that we can understand and have an experience of. Right. So that's kind of what Owen Barfield was in my mind is very important. And, mm -hmm. you know, John Woodcock, he's a big fan of Owen Barfield. Sure. So uh, anyway, thanks Miles for bringing it up. Well, well, thank you for that 
additional information. One of the things that really struck me, and I'm still working with it, is that at some point, um, Paul Vanderclay, referring to Owen Barfield, said that Owen Barfield stated that poets will save the world. And it's like, wow, that that gives me a lot of hope. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have more, I now have more hope that if we could spend time in poetry and art, you know, as, as, a, as a language within us, that that's going to more likely save our planet as opposed to thinking we're going to, we're going to come up with some scientific technocratic fix. Right, right. now from a, on a political comment here, um, it can also destroy us because um, from my perspective, and I, I speak only for myself, um, it appears to me that that our president has been inundated by the self, by the self within him. And he hasn't uh, adapted it to modern civilization. So he keeps acting out, out outside the boundaries of where we've created civilization. Now that isn't to say that we don't have to make omelets every so often. Okay, in other words, when we become too rigid, and as Jordan Peterson correctly said, uh, when a, a civilization becomes too orderly, it need, and it be, and therefore becomes corrupt, then it has to be broken down, and and then there's a time of chaos, and then it rebuilds itself. And the strength of the United States has always been that we have so many interest groups and so many different people origins of everybody in the country that we're constantly debating and that's constantly trying making us uh, make an omelet okay to a lesser extent you have that in Canada it's not quite as big as the United States but but it's the same type of thing where you have many different uh, ethnic and religious and uh, racial backgrounds of people in Canada and all these different civilizations are crashing together and breaking up against one another and forcing people to adapt. And, but sometimes if you don't have a good balance between this God image and uh, a strong ego, then, um, then the God image takes over and then you think you are God (laughs) and you think you can do whatever you want. And, you know, so, uh, you know, I'm sure the president didn't think anything about the hundreds of Kurds he's killed in the last week, probably doesn't think of that at all. One of the things though, I would like to ask you about though, is that there there are first of all one of the strengths i've recently learned of the united states is the most that you really have the most powerful protections regarding freedom of speech and it didn't occur to me until recently that in canada we have a charter of rights that has in it a freedom of speech but believe it or not it can actually be overruled by what's called a notwithstanding clause. Um, where, uh, so, and I won't try to explain that, but we have, several, we have three orders of government. There's the federal government, there's the provincial governments. And indeed what holds us together is a, as provinces is a federal constitution, but provinces can actually override the charter of rights. And that's why Jordan Peterson really got into this, embroiled into trying to fight enforced speech, these pronouns that he was yeah. really having. Well, a, getting... I, I'm totally with him on that. Um, but that would never happen in the United States. Well, I mean, I would suggest it, someone could try to make it happen, though. That's the problem. That's That's the great fear. I mean, obviously, the freedom of speech and the freedom of religion is uh, and freedom of the press, of course, 
and the freedom of assembly. All these freedoms are carried in the, in the First Amendment to the US Constitution. And everyone at the time of the Constitutional Convention knew that they were necessary, but they couldn't, they couldn't ratify the basic constitution with those rights in it, but they agreed that they would make it as the First Amendment. So they ratified the constitution and then 10 months later, they ratified the First Amendment. But, you know, but there is, and, uh, there are controls can... though. There are controls. They're not controls by the government. The government's not allowed to control it, but the way it gets controlled is because you can say whatever you want, but there are consequences. You can't, and, and some things you are controlled, like you can't shout fire in a, in a crowded theater, for example. That would be... Um, uh, Apparently, uh, now correct me if you know any otherwise, but it was actually Ken Wilbur said that in the United States, um, you can only be charged, or you're, you're, the only illegal speech is, is saying something like fire in a theater, which is right. false, or um, inciting violence in real time. Right. Very, inciting to riot. Yeah. Yeah. You can actually say things in the United States that would get you in trouble here as hate speech in Canada, uh, whereas you apparently can say things that could, um, could be related to uh, calling for violence against somebody, but if you're not doing it in real time, it's permissible. You, you can say well, some really... Anyway. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that you can get away with a lot in the US, but if, if you actually cause somebody to go murder somebody else, for example, then they'll get you on something else. They won't get you on, on the, the speech that you gave, but they'll, they'll get you on, on inciting to riot or something like that. Um, and, um, you know, or um, conspiracy to commit murder or something. And the way it works in the United States is karma. It's very simple. What goes around comes around. So if you say really outrageous things, um, those really outrageous things are going to come back and bite you in a really outrageous way. And, um, you know, we haven't seen that too much yet uh, in the case of our president, but that's another part of my prophecy that, that um, you know, the president and his family is, and his businesses such as they are, are going to go down in a really nasty way and it won't be pretty. And even if he manages to negotiate some sort of deal so that he stays out of federal prison um, and keeps his family out of federal prison, I mean, that's a big yes. That's, that's way more than uh, Gerald Ford did for Richard Nixon, uh, but even if he, does negotiate something that makes people leave, leave, you know, let off not only himself, but his sons and daughter and uh, his son-in-law, um, they're not going to have a happy life. You know, it, all we have to do is uh, look at him today and we know that he doesn't have a happy life. Um, and I don't think there's probably much of anyone in the world that would want to trade places with him today. <laughs> the curious thing though is, you know, and I'm looking at this as a non-American, so give me, um, you know, some understanding here, but uh, you, with the strength of your freedom of speech, it seems strange that Trump hasn't been removed from office long a long time ago that the people would would with the, the power of that freedom of speech have used it by now to actually have gotten gotten him out of office for many of the previous lies uh, that he's committed uh, and yet and even now he's he's actually openly saying China investigate 
Biden yeah. and right. getting away with it. You know, it's like, right. well, how's well, this he's, he's gotten Well, he's gotten away with his bully behavior for a very long time. And it, and the result is he's, he's also built up a quantity of bad karma. Uh, and that's going to come back and bite him really big is my prediction. And um, so Rocket King says, whether you love or hate him, Donnie Boy is sure as hell shaking things up. Well, yes, he is shaking things up. And, and you know, it's evident that uh, we needed to be shaken up because, you know, everybody thought that Hillary Clinton had a lock on the last election and the Democratic Party ignored um, the labor unions in the, in the Rust Belt and in a way they deserved what they got um, to lose because, uh, you know, the, the unions were always the, the bread and butter of the Democratic Party and then suddenly, um, suddenly the Democratic Party starts to ignore them and, um, and you know, they got some karma too. They got some karma back in 2016 and people have to go back and look at, look at that and, and see that we have to make changes. Okay, there's no doubt that neither party is perfect and neither, neither um, you know, neither uh, presidential candidate was perfect. And Skip, I have to depart, but uh, can I ask one ask last question sure. for you to consider, if you will? And that is, do you think that that presidents are just placeholders, and in fact, um, you know, like Trump doesn't even have the intellect to understand what he's doing in Turkey or any of these places? Is that there's there's a wizard behind the curtain? Um, other machines at work <laughs> that well, are there actually are lots of things. Yeah, there's uh, obviously lots of things at work. I mean, that's what these testimonies in the last week have been about. The one today, uh, where and the you know the whole whistleblower thing is that you know we we have a very complex government in the United States. We have more than two million people that work for the U.S. government, and and all of us who have taken an oath, and I've taken the oath seven times personally, um, ha have an opinion. Ha each of us has our individual opinion about what the what the oath and the and the um, commitment to the country as a country with a rule with the rule of law and as committed to laws. Um, what that means, okay? So you have two million different perspectives, but I think by and large, we all pretty much agree. In other words, um, if I were in battle with my fellow Marines, I don't think you could get a dime between our opinions on what it was that we were doing or are doing as Marines. Um, and, uh, you know, we're all pretty clear on what our commitment to the country is. Um, but, you know, occasionally we get an outlier and, and you know, there's a, there's a saying in Japan, the protruding nail gets hammered down. And so what, uh, what's happening to our president is that um, he's a protruding nail for a lot of us. And inevitably he's gonna get hammered down. Uh, it may not happen now. I'm not saying it's going to happen now or be for the next election. He could win the next election, but um, I, do, I don't think that man is going to ever have another day of happiness if, he, if he's ever had one in his lifetime. I'd be very surprised. Um, well, thoughts? we have uh, experts in each of the government fields, and he does not listen to them. And they've spent years training, researching uh, statistics, even the support for the Marines uh, 
you have all this uh, super network that supports you that it's just sure. fantastic and it's built absolutely managed very well you know yeah no doubt and these people are professionals experts and so forth and right yet we have someone that wants to get rid of the people at the top that don't agree with his particular uh, philosophy or whatever he thinks I mean he just he's getting rid of people right and left Right, because they don't agree with him. Okay, so um, you know one of the one of the things that I learned, and I'm going to share something with this group that has hung in with us, um, because uh, let me just see where did I put it? Where is it? Naturally, it's the one thing that has gone off my screen that, we, that I need. Here it is. Okay, so um, one of the things that I'm going to talk about in my talk on the 27th is a couple of religious experiences that I had. Um, and they're... Uh, I've only had one in an actual Christian service, which was had to do with the uh, baptism of my grandson. But but uh, sometimes when I'm really down in the dumps, um, I go into the Naval Academy Chapel uh, and just meditate there at a time when the place isn't um, isn't going. So um, I am going to be talking in my talk, uh, my public talk about uh, why I was so down in the dumps that particular day. And the reason was that um, I had discovered that uh, the rule of law um, has been basically ignored in the state of Maryland uh, in many, many ways, but I had the experience of running into it and getting snagged by it. And so um, I did in 2015, when I was right in the middle of it, I created a, a 45 minute video. And so this is the trailer for the video. And, um, and you'll need this be, and you'll want to take it now because, um, where did it go? Be, because this is still, this video is still unlisted. So you'll, you won't be able to find it later on YouTube unless you have these links. Um, but I made the, these two, the second one is a 45 minute version of the five minute version um, trailer that I have given you in the first link. And so what, what um, that video is about is the fact that the courts of the state of Maryland, besides a, a lot of other uh, shenanigans allowed, um, well, in that video, which was done in 2015, it allowed um, the, the credit union to change the name of the plaintiff uh, without, uh, without uh, any basis for doing that. And subsequently, they allowed the plaintiff to be changed three more times. And uh, that happened after these two videos that I did here. And um, so uh, I haven't gone out of my way uh, to make this public uh, up till now. Um, but what it reflects is just how badly the rule of law has been um, undercut in the United States and especially by the GOP and the financial industry. And um, it's an issue that has troubled me very greatly uh, for a very long period of time. 
And um, so now I'm going to start rolling this out over, um, over the next uh, few months. So as of now, these two videos are unlisted. So if you have the link, you can find them and see them. But if you don't have the link, you won't be able to find them on YouTube. Um, and, um, you know, the fact is that the financial industry got themselves paid double on all uh, foreclosures after the 2008 um, crash, once by the TARP and once by homeowners whose home was taken away from them. Uh, but the a financial industry came up smelling like a rose. So the result is that here in my town, I live on a, in a community that happens to have a marina. All the yachts grew. Okay, they're they're twice the size of what they were um, a decade ago. Because you know, if you've got money coming out of your ears because you've harvested the life savings of the baby boom. Um, then you got to spend the money on something. And, um, and that's what, um, and that's what the financial industry did. And, um, I fought this lawsuit for nine years. Um, and ultimately I lost because, um, you have to render under Caesar what is Caesar's in the end. But, um, but what I discovered in the process of doing that lawsuit, where I put more than 4,000 pages of evidence on the record in the Maryland courts, is that um, they're basically the land records in the United States in every county in the United States are just a facade. There, um, there's no they don't represent the truth of who owns what. Um, and uh, there's no way to figure it out uh, because the financial industry moved that entire system out of the courthouses. So you do the courthouse, um, let's call it a, a drama that you do on closing day when you buy your house. Uh, but once you file the papers, uh, you have no idea what the financial industry is going to do. And what the what they did basically was they created a uh, false currency in the form of mortgage-backed securities, um, which they inflated unmercifully. Um, again, making a lot of money in the process. Um, and then, um, and then they, um, when they finally crashed the economy, uh, they didn't hesitate to take the bailout from the federal government and they didn't hesitate to, every, to take everybody's homes too. So they got paid double. And to understand how hypocritical this is, it so happened that I was at a conference of major real estate developers in um, California when, the, when Lehman Brothers went bankrupt on September 15th, um, 2008. I was at this conference and we were standing in the, in the, lobby looking at the news and the ticker going by and so on. And, and one of these guys says to another one, well, it was stupid of us to have a financial crash in the middle of a presidential campaign. And, and that's right. <laughs> that's one of the things that got Barack Obama elected originally. Uh, but uh, because they got greedy um, they crashed the economy and there were some controls put on it afterward in the Dodd-Frank bill, but essentially all those have been removed now. So I wouldn't be surprised at all to 
see the economy crash again uh, at some time. And uh, so what I can advise all of my listeners is please make sure you have your uh, portfolio uh, very well diversified and uh, don't assume that just because you own a home, you're safe. Okay, that's what I did assume, and that was a big mistake. So anyway, uh, that's what I have to say about that. <laughs> All right, I'll chime back in and say I will take your advice and make sure I scatter my assets around, you know. Yeah, don't but put I it mean, all in your you know, home. Yeah, the housing uh, thing really just destroyed, uh, uh, you know, what... Uh, a lot of people uh, and lives and yet i've i really don't know has anybody paid for that at all no yeah in other no words, they they got away with it yeah i mean it's, and, it's been 11 course, it's yeah it's been 11 years since that happened and, yeah and the uh, maryland the maryland courts let them get away with it and uh yeah. you know all the way up to the u.s supreme court yeah and and they never allowed me to take the case to a jury. So I never got a, a hearing by a jury of my peers. It was just judges that said, nope, we're going to side with the banks. And so that's what we have in the U.S., everybody. And it's in red states and blue states. So uh, it's time to for Americans to wise up and understand that Wall Street is not your friend. And your local neighborhood banker is not your friend either, necessarily. <laughs> and, and so be very wise about where you've put your money. Um, and if you put it in real estate, there's a big risk in doing that, okay? Uh, because if, if they crash the economy, which is what they did in 2008, and things get bad, and then suddenly you need to get your equity out of your house. It might not be easy. And, you know, that's what happened to me. I had a house that had been valued at a $1.2 million and it suddenly um, went to $500,000. And so it was lower than the, than the mortgage that I had on it. And of course, because the economy was destroyed, there were, I had no income. Uh, to uh, keep paying my mortgage. And so I lost the house too, and all my equity. That's how it happens. And so um, it's, a, it's a sad tale, but I have no doubt that I am right because I did all the legal work on it personally, every frigging word and every letter in that 4,000 pages was put there by me. And so I know what the case is and nobody can come back and deny it uh, because it's all on the record. I put it on the record. So, and. Uh, well, on a positive note, I think that just hearing your story can help people to hear from some of us older folks about the trials and tribulations. That, that right, and I, I did I did go into some detail on these two videos, okay? And, yeah. and so you can watch the five minute one and get a pretty good summary of what happened. The 45 minute one's a little better, but keeping in mind that I did that video in July, or no, in October of 2015, and it's now October 2019, so four years later, and mm -hmm. Um, subsequently to that video, uh, the courts of Maryland allowed the banks to change the plaintiff three more times and without so much as leave. And of course, I never had a chance to question who actually owns the mortgage and they just never would allow that. And finally, I was ordered not to not to fight anymore, but that was the upshot of it after five trips to the Court of Appeals of Maryland and one trip to the U.S. Supreme Court. So, so they got my life savings, and I know that there's about 10 million families out there that lost their homes in a very similar way, most of them 
didn't know what was happening to him. So I made these videos so that people could know what was happening to them. Um, and it could happen again. And it can easily happen again because um, after our president took office, they basically cut out all the all the safeties that were put on um, by the Obama administration. And so the same problem is, is there and they're still doing the same shenanigans that they always were. Ah, uh, Rocket King says, hey, public schools throw out public speaking and put in personal finance, please. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. We need not only personal finance, but also psychology in the public schools. The right kind, the right kind of psychology. The right kind of psychology, not the kind that gets you addicted to drugs, but the kind that um, helps you understand how your life is going to go and, and how to deal with the issues that come up in your lifetime. That's one of the biggies. Um, and we, we've done that very poorly. We've gone around uh, like Chicken Little, um, you know, whistling in the wind, hoping that the sky doesn't fall and it, it can easily fall on us again. And um, that's that's funny. In the sixth grade, I played Chicken Little in <laughs> the play. The sky is falling. Oh, <laughs> did you? Yeah, the sky is falling. So. Well, well, we'll see. But you know, I, our president was making these comments about about where he has properties. I'm not going to repeat it because I don't want to be called an instigator, but, um, you know, he's made a lot of people in the Middle East angry with him. And he's, he's a very vulnerable duck in the, in the financial world and in his business world. And, um, He's, you know, there's what goes around comes around. Karma is real. <laughs> well, you know, there's two, there's two endings to the chicken little story. There's the good ending where everybody's happy and the fox tells them to, you know, to go back. It was just an uh, acorn that fell on his head or a leaf, you know. Right. The other is that he leads them into the fox's den and he eats all the chickens. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, uh, I think we're, we're, well, my prophecy is that our president will not have another happy day in his lifetime. Um, that's, I think that's a fair enough prophecy, um, regardless. So uh, Robert says, I've been studying my dreams for some time. Should I start the process of interpreting some of my dreams have touched upon the collective. I want to make sure I'm ready. Should I wait for more dreams? Uh, no, Robert, you should start to pay attention to your dreams. But let, let me clarify that uh, you are not interpreting your dreams. Your dreams are interpreting you. And your dreams and visions are messages sent to you by the self. Now, let me clarify what that means. It means that um, what Dr. Young called the two million year old <clears throat> man, <clears throat> but we've come a ways in our understanding of paleontology and things since his lifetime. And so now we can say with fair clarity that our ancestry goes back three and a half billion years. And so our psyche is three and a half billion years old. And that psyche has kept us, kept all of our ancestors alive um, through every generation. They've all successfully reproduced and they all have stayed alive long enough to reproduce um, for 3.5 billion years, okay? And so from an evolutionary point of view, this is your unconscious. And so that unconscious communicates to you in images. It doesn't communicate 
to you in language because language was only invented um, perhaps 5,000 years ago, at least written language. And so your psyche communicates with you in images and it's up to you to understand what those images mean. And, and it's, it's a heck of a lot wiser than you are. And um, I often tell the story about the fact that I don't need a radar detector on my automobile. I don't know if people use those much anymore because I think they're illegal, but you know, back 20 years ago, they were using them a lot. And what I learned is that I have no need of one because my psyche knows when there's radar in the area and it sends me an image and that image is always the same thing. It's a police car going from right to left across my field of vision. It's a black and white and it says police on it. And every time I have that vision, I know that within one to two minutes, I will see police activity and it never fails. And so that's just an example of a living vision where my three and a half billion year old man, the self, the God image tells me that, that uh, I have to mind my P's and Q's <laughs> and, and um, so, but you know, our, our psyche is sending us messages seven by 24 by 365. It's not only in dreams, it's all the time. And the only difference is that when we take our conscious mind aside, then they can get through. In your waking life, you have so much other stuff going on that it's like blasted out. It's like having uh, too much sunlight or something. So you can't see what's coming up from your unconscious. And except when something's really traumatic or really urgent, like the police car or the, the goat that Abraham saw right before he cut Isaac's throat. He was obviously traumatized by the fact that he was going to kill his son. And um, he had this vision, um, which was that he could sacrifice a goat instead of Isaac. And the result of that is that we have uh, the Jewish and the tr Christian religion and Islam. Um, because all three religions point back to Abraham. Um, so anyway, comments on that? Jerome? Uh, well, I was going to read Nancy Toff's, uh says a good dream work, Robert Johnson's inner work, also by Robert Loschnack, A Little Course in Dreams, a basic handbook of Jungian dream work. Right. And uh, it is what Robert was uh, original comment in interpreting dreams uh, it's very important that you don't try to make up stuff and that's your ego talking. So you yeah. really need to focus on what these images are. They may not what, be what you think they are. That's right. I mean, they, you can't go buy a book of dreams and get that description of what your dream means and make it mean anything. You have to say, what is my three and a half billion year old man trying to say to me, yeah. what right. is the message? Yeah. And, and the only way it has to communicate with you is through images. Now that image could be, um, it could be a voice. Sometimes it is a voice and it could be music. Um, but it, it's almost never, um, it's almost never, you know, words or whatever, um, you know, occasionally, I mean, we, we have some examples in the Bible of where um, Yahweh spoke to Job and others, I suppose, but, um, you know, and you, you occasionally I hear a word or two in a dream, ex cathedra, meaning it's as if you're in the cathedral and all of a sudden this voice comes down upon you. And, and so that's a way that it can come to you. Um, but uh, the, the way to 
do dream work really in my opinion this is my opinion and i i've not read robert johnson's book so i can't uh, say what robert said and he was a leading union analyst of the 20th century so he was an important guy um but what i would say is that um you know, you have to try to work out what the dream is trying to say to you based on your current life. And so, as I said, sometimes I have this vision of a police car and because of long experience now and decades of driving, I know what that vision means. When I get that vision, I know what it means. <laughs> but they obviously mean more than that. Uh, but go ahead. But they can also have an emotional effect. Uh, if you get up, sometimes you wake up, might wake up uh, jittery or, uh, you mm -hmm. know, there's all sorts of effects that come. As a matter of fact, the sure. big dreams, what they call a big dream is one where you experience a lot of effect. Uh, right. You uh, have a lot of emotion or, or something. And yeah, of right. course, of course, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar saw the handwriting on the wall. <laughs> All right, it could be a vision. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, it was could be that, um, and um, that's why it's hard to just, as you say, read a book about it. You really just have to come up to your images. Young suggested that his analysts study mythology and ancient symbols because they have a tendency to repeat themselves over and over throughout history. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you're forming some sort of something that's been repeated. And you said before, the Bible is full of those stories. It's just, uh, we need to recreate those in a way to understand that those are, those are those ancient man symbols coming out. Right. And if you look at the Bible, I mean, most of the things that went on are either dreams or visions. Um, That's right, and, and it expressly says that in the Bible. But you know, when you're young and you're studying it in Bible school, you don't quite grok what what they mean. Um, and I, you know, I think that there are a lot of ministers and pastors, and maybe priests, who don't understand the significance of the fact that these are dreams and visions. Well, and they also want to make it logical, and it's not logical; it's illogical, and that's where the that's how the whole idea of the archetypes they're not logical. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so Nancy added another good book for dream work is "Let Your Body Interpret Your Dreams." I agree with that. And uh, Rocket King says thanks, Nancy. I'm putting down a note for those. Robert says, I've, I've been thinking of the symbols that come up from dreams consciously in my mind, in my heart. It's just very difficult to figure out what the self is trying to say. I figure it just takes time. You're right about that, Robert. And it's very important to write down your dreams if you can remember them. I, I keep uh, a dream journal personally. And um, you your dreams may be telling you something over a period of time. And it's only after you've had 10 dreams or 50 dreams or something that um, you really can put it together. And uh, Dr. Young did a dream interpretation of Wolfgang Pauli that lasted 10 years and went over 400 dreams. And he uh, he covers that in his book. I think it's in Psychology and Alchemy. And maybe in one other book, I think he repeated the dream cycle with Polly. Um, but, um, but he only covered 53 of the dreams that were particularly noteworthy. But, but I know that the entire process took 10 years and at least 400 dreams, I think. Do you recall that, Jerome? How many dreams? Uh, it about? was quite. It was quite a few. Uh, yeah. But in other words, you're establishing a pattern. Uh, like, for instance, the Gestalt therapy. You you're going around the whole area that you're looking at, and you're establishing. It's almost a Mandela in effect. Mm -hmm. uh, and putting this uh, scenario together. Uh, and then you come up with a coherent picture that, uh, 
in his right. own. So you, right. you can't just you can't just look at one dream and say that's it. You know. Well, and also our our self is telling us about vocation and what we should be doing now. Okay, and so um, I've been through many stages in my life. Uh, and I know that Jerome has too, but, you know, big stages for me were, of course, education, where I got three advanced degrees and uh, a diploma in Mandarin Chinese, <laughs> and then uh, found them all useless, <laughs> entirely useless. And um, then I served 23 years in the Marine Corps and... Uh, 20 of that in reserve. And then I practiced law and walked away from that after five years and uh, went into business. And I've started, believe it or not, 25 businesses in my career. And I, of those, I managed to get one of them public. Um, and about half of them succeeded. Most of them that succeeded, I sold out of too early. Uh, I should, should have stayed. Uh, and, uh, but always myself was telling me, what is the next thing I should be doing? And I keep following that. And, you know, myself told me to fight the lawsuit that I uh, handled personally for nine years. Uh, and I mean, I did everything, all of the clerical work and all the legal work in that lawsuit. And, um, but I, I didn't have any choice <laughs> myself made me do it. But finally, it said, okay, enough. And so fortunately, I, my wife and I had already moved out of the house uh, a year and a half earlier. So it wasn't quite a bit, quite a, as big of a pain. Uh, but you know, myself got me into what I'm doing now and got me into uh, being interested in Dr. Young's work and, and getting to it in enough depth so I understand it. And, um, or if I don't understand it perfectly, at least I understand it um, plus or minus as well as the average union analyst. Um, except that I don't claim to have the, the, prof the professional knowledge that a union anal analyst would have for their clinical work. So I don't claim that knowledge and I don't claim to be a mental health professional, but in terms of what Dr. Jung was saying about religion and so on, I think I'm pretty clear about that. Um, well, and you can help clarify it into the average person's knowledge of, uh, uh, you know, interpret that for them in terms of who are not youngians. Uh, right. They tend to be very, uh, oh, they're, they're professional. I mean, I have great respect for them, but they also are at the, more the academic type of uh, uh, description, some of them. Uh, right. I do find some that are very helpful. Mm -hmm. But uh, what you can do is bring this uh, to where people that are not familiar with Young and help as an introduction and get them interested in reading Young. Because that's right. Uh, I've, uh, look, I was listening to one of your videos with Marta, Marta, I'm sorry, and uh, she was saying, I have to read this thing four times, this book. She was reading, uh, you know, uh, the uh, book on. Uh, Murray Stein written for BTS right. and she said I have to read this thing four times and I'm still I'm gonna have to read it again you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> well that's what it is because Jung was su such a genius um, and he basically went against everything that was in his upbringing in some way um, and so when you talk about Jung, you're having to rethink lots of things that you were, you were taught growing up. It, it's just not the way we were taught, not at all. Okay. And, you know, yeah, I, you, yeah, you examine your assumptions that you made up to a certain point and all of a sudden you realize that, well, why did I make those assumptions? Yeah. 
And he, he gives that, he, he lets you play with that. And you can go back and forth and say, oh. Yeah. Right. So I, um, and, you know, I've said before that I often just get overwhelmed to the point where I just have to go lie down and, and let my mind uh, just reshuffle the deck sort of <laughs> before I, I mean I, I took two naps today be you know very short ones but 10 or 15 minutes I just had to go rest my mind because uh, the complexities of what are, what we're facing today and that's everybody okay when you know the statistic that I have noted a few times was that in the 14th century the average person um, got exposed to as much information in a lifetime as the average 21st century person gets exposed to in the Sunday New York Times today and in a lifetime. And so we're being exposed now as compared to people in the 19th century, let's say, uh, to between 20 and 100 times as much information as our forefathers were only 100 or 200 years ago. And uh, it is overwhelming and, and we have to work out a way to deal with it. And uh, we deal with it by re relying on both the unconscious and the collective unconscious. And, and uh, actually Jordan Peterson was giving an example of that 10 years ago in the, in the video that I mentioned tonight. Um, and, you know, he, what he was saying in that video was, um, you know, he says, this, this room tells you how to, how to behave in it because all the seats are pointed in one direction and so everybody goes and sits and they face in that direction. And it's set up like a theater and a lecture is like a drama. And, uh, and it is a little drama. And we rely on the electricity that comes in here and people that are working very hard at the electric plant to keep the power in the, in the place and all the other things that you rely on you know, including snow shoveling outside the University of Toronto, I suppose, um, you know, all those many things. And, and we have to learn how to cope and use the tools that we have today. We didn't have uh, iPhones 20 years ago. We've had cell phones, I guess, for about 30 years. Um, but, you know, television sets have changed the way we behave with one another and um, you know my my mother-in-law who's still with us uh, you know remembers a time when they had an ice box in her house and not a refrigerator where the, the local uh, ice plant would deliver ice and they would put it in the in the box and keep their food cold and so so we we have a big task modern people have a big task uh, and we have to know what is necessary to know and what isn't necessary to know and to understand why. And <laughs> so uh, the, I guess that's the best thing I can say about my MBA program, which was all statistics, 15 courses in statistics by different names and, and uh, the best thing I learned from it was uh, uh, so that nobody can bullshit me anymore <laughs> with statistics. Anyway, okay, let's look back here a minute. Um, Doro says, uh, when ego meets heart, the old world transforms and everything changes for the, for the much better. Yes, I agree with that. Nancy says, Marie Louise von Franz's book, Interpretation of Fairy Tales, gives some modeling about interpreting symbols. That's also great. Um, and that happens to be one I've read. And Doro says, All the old memes are changing into miracles. Are we entering the numinous? Well, we certainly are. 
entering the newness. And because, and the point of my lecture on the 27th of October is uh, to make everybody aware of the numinous events that occur in their own lives. Uh, because these, these examples happen to me all the time. And, you know, th 3,500 years ago, uh, a vision like the lamb being presented to Abraham so that he didn't have to sacrifice Isaac, um, that was certainly a miracle in a number of ways. Number one, it represented the end of human sacrifice in the Western world. That was an important one. Um, but it's, it's actually, in terms of what it is in current understanding, it's a rather mundane type of vision that happens to everybody, I'm convinced, because uh, I've been reading recently. Let's see if I have it right here. Yeah, I have this book, which I highly recommend. I try to keep them handy here. Okay, Trauma and the Soul by Dr. Donald Kalshin. And what Dr. Kalshin talks about is how when you're having a traumatic experience, it's very likely that you're, uh, you're going to have a vision or a dream that will help you. Um, and so he gives a really dramatic example that I like. I'll just read it to you if you haven't heard it. It's about the little girl and the angel. It's short. Uh, it's on page 28 of Dr. Kalshin's book. Uh, but he took it from Esther Harding, who was a first generation a follower of Dr. Young. And so um, this is the story. The, the mother sent her young daughter to her father's study one morning to deliver an important note written on a piece of paper. The little girl went off to deliver the note. Shortly thereafter, the daughter came back in tears and said, I'm sorry, mother, the angel won't let me go in. Whereupon the mother sent the daughter back a second time with the same result, only this time more tears and distress. At this point, the mother became irritated at her youngster's imaginative excess. So she took her little girl by the hand and the two of them marched the message over to the father. As they entered the father's study, the mother saw her husband slumped in his chair, his drink spilled on the floor, dead from a heart attack. And so the point is that this little girl, six-year-old girl, had a vision of an angel and Henrietta Wyeth did a painting of it um, where the little girl had a vision of an angel that wouldn't let her see the reality of her father's death until um, her mother could intermediate with her. And, um, and this book is full of those. Um, and so it's very common when, when you have a traumatic thing going on that, you know, you may have a dream or vision and it may come to your aid. And um, it can be every bit as powerful as any vision that came in the Bible. But Jerome, you have any comments? Yeah, I think uh, Kalshed's uh, book is very good and would recommend that to anyone. Plus, he also has some videos that you can just search. Right. Yeah, uh, there's a couple of good ones on uh, Pacifica Graduate Institute. Right. Um, and so any internet search can bring it up. Just type in Donald Kalshed and uh, that's the way I find stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he, he's or, got a very good one on uh, on Pacifica. So yeah. Pacifica Graduate Institute has many very valuable um, videos on Jungian psychology style of things, and I highly recommend that to anyone. Yeah, yeah um, I've, su I've subscribed to that channel. It's just uh, so they alert me when something new comes out. So it's a great thing. 
Yeah, so Granada says, where's the info overdose? <laughs> Uh, I don't know. Grenad says, uh, what would happen if everyone experienced a numinous event simultaneously? Well, that's what happened at the Pentecost, um, which was uh, when Christ came back, I guess, what, 40 days after his uh, crucifixion, and he was seen by uh, all of the apostles at that time. That was this, that was the same one that I was going to reference to his question. So yeah, that's a good example. Yeah, and uh, so that was the birthday of the church was Pentecost, and so that's what happens when many people experience an event, and and it definitely can happen, um, and so and. Dora Pollock says, yes, we will, we will soon find out because, you know, there may be numinous um, reactions coming up in the collective uh, around what the, what the karmic consequences are going to be for our president. And I wouldn't be surprised at all to hear of numinous things happening. And Chetwin's aboriginal song lines may be coming to a land close by. We are ready. Okay, maybe. Um, let's hope so. Let's hope the lights stay on. Uh, this week we had the sailboat show here in Annapolis, and we had too, uh, too much of a good thing in terms of climate change because there's this much water <laughs> in it where all the booths were for the sailboat show, uh, you couldn't go there because you would have water up to your knees and it's getting pretty cold these days. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, yeah so Annapolis is already sinking and, and uh, my wife uh, commented that there was an article in the paper saying that the Navy is having to consider moving the Naval Academy away from Annapolis because... Oh because uh, it's too low. And in Hurricane Isabel, uh, the Navy had five um, wind tunnels under a road along the Severn River. And one of them is a, is a Mach 1 wind tunnel, so it can make fake wind at the speed of sound. And so very expensive device, obviously. And, but they're all in the basement and so when Hurricane Isabel came in 2003, those were all flooded and destroyed. And I think they rebuilt them, but uh, it's, it's a close thing, actually. I mean, Navy is, Naval Academy is only two or three feet above the high water mark. And uh, so it's very possible that they'll have to move it uh, sometime soon maybe sooner than they think actually. Okay, any other comments before we go on to our next event here? Okay, um, well, I hope this has been a useful and interesting conversation tonight. Um, I tried to be as kind as I possibly could in terms of current affairs. And um, if, any of you are interested in the two videos that I mentioned in the chat here, uh, please get the linkages before you leave um, the screen because those videos are unlisted and so you won't be able to find them uh, if you don't go back and get them now. And uh, so I'll, I'll leave them there in the chat as long as YouTube leaves the chat, but like YouTube's lately not be leaving the chat on the, on the replays. So, um, yeah, I've noticed that. I don't know why either, because uh, some of the things mentioned during the sessions, and you put it on the chat, and there's no way to find what you put down. Uh, right. I guess you could include those in your description after you publish the video. Right. Okay. So I, I'll consider doing that after this uh, video renders and goes in playback mode, maybe I can put those links in there. 
Uh, yeah. But to be sure you can get them, everybody should go back in the chat now and look for those links that I provided. Um, and uh, so anything else to talk about? Anything that you want to talk about next week, particularly? I think you just go on your intuition on what to talk about. So I'd go with that. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I've been doing, uh, and it, se it seems to be okay. So yeah. just, a, just a reminder that um, uh, Skip is going to be speaking on Sunday, October 27th <clears throat> at 2 p.m. I'm intending to uh, broadcast the talk live uh, at that time. It's 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern Daylight Time and or Eastern time. I don't know if it'll still be daylight time, but anyway, it'll be Eastern time. And um, I'm also having that professionally re video recorded. So there'll be better video of, of that event after the fact. But uh, if you want to see it live and see if anybody burns me at the stake. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting group. I went to their meeting yesterday, and I think I'm going to come off a little bit better because their their uh, speaker yesterday uh, came an hour late, <laughs> oh. uh, which was really embarrassing. Yeah, and a marine is never late, so you. No, be I won't. I won't be late. I'll be there on time, definitely. Uh, and. Uh, <laughs> So not, not intentionally anyway. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, peace, everyone. Thank you yeah. for joining us. Thanks uh, we, a lot, Skip. Yeah, so. we've had quite an ongoing online following tonight. There's uh, 19 people watching right now. Oh, cool. and, All right. and that usually adds up to about yeah. 100 through the evening. I so. encourage people to use the comments section if you want to. Uh, communicate some yeah. of these things and maybe suggest some ideas if you right. uh, want, to, right. want to be talked about. Yeah, so. definitely. And uh, Granada asks a question, any public speaking tips? Well, public speaking tips, um, I, I would recommend you do what I did, which was, which is go to the venue where the same audience is going to be a week before and, and see how that, how your audience is going to be. And, Make sure you know your venue uh, so that there are no surprises when you get there. Uh, there can always be surprises, and uh, usually they involve technology, unfortunately. Um, there used to be a Toastmasters club that you could join just to practice speaking. Yeah. Because I remember I joined that one time. And yeah, that's that's good. And that, I don't know if they're still around. But oh, yeah, they are. I've heard of them recently. Yeah. And um, and you just practice speeches and people give you feedback. Uh, right. There's, you know, it's a non-threatening environment until you get out to the public. So. Right. And, and fortunately, what I learned yesterday by going to the meeting before my meeting is that my audience is a really laid back group <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so that gives me confidence that things are going to go well cool. and the other i guess the other point i would make granada is to trust yourself in other words I, you know i've had a, a few notes here nothing much on one page for this evening but somehow i managed to talk for two hours so um you know if you talk from the heart um, you're going to be more effective than if you try to write down every word which is what i used to do i you know back in my rationalist days i used to write every word of a speech and then just read it out and um but nowadays i just let it go and it seems to work uh, better it, it seems to work better and I, I know when I do these sessions I am speaking from the self because afterward I never can remember what it is we were talking about in my conscious mind I, I just have no idea and I have to go back and look at the video personally I have to go back <laughs> and say okay what were we talking about there? 
<laughs> and then I'll, I'll go back and I'll say, I said that. <laughs> and then right. sometimes I'll say, well, that was pretty good. You know, so and, it, so. and that's what happens in any conversation, really. Uh, and so if you have friends and you have a conversation with your friends and you get drawn into the conversation, then you know that you're in a good place for, for your communication uh, because you're, you're communicating with someone at a very deep level. And uh, so I would urge you to know your stuff and then, then just let it fly. That's the best I can say. Anyway, thank you, Jerome, so much yeah, for thank your, you. thank your help, not only here, but in, in other places that we know. Yeah. And, uh, oh, I appreciate the mention on Nancy's number uh, three there. I noticed on the closing remarks, you said technical assistance. Right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, it was high time that I changed the closing credits because yeah. uh, the closing credits were there. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> whatever if you'd like me to change it differently <laughs> no it's fine it's, it went by so fast i had to pause it and back up you know? right well i i'm not i'm not big on um, i'm not big on titles and and closing credits because yeah. i think people don't pay attention to them anyway and if they want to then they will stop it and, yeah. and yeah. see see what it says so right anyway you're okay, right. peace. I'm going to all sign right. off Same. and thank you all for joining us tonight. I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Bye bye.